I'm Dan Linstead. Welcome back. Today, we are delighted to have Sanjay Pandey. Sanjay, why don't you tell the audience uh, who you are? Hi, everyone. I'm Sanjay Pandey, and I'm uh, one of the business partners at Data Vault Alliance, and I am one of the authorized trainers. I take care of the students in India and surrounding areas. Dan, today I really want to talk about uh, some new emerging technologies and things that we've actually been waiting for, which the Data Vault has actually been ready for a long time. And people don't realize this. And I, I want to start with a story of yours. There's something called an operational data vault. The story of Send and Timeshare and how they built out their operational data vaults was the analytical solution and the transaction solution actually had no gaps in them. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Send and Timeshare is no more as a company, as I understand it. They got bought out and absorbed into something else, some other company. But, And I know that story as well. It was partly due to the fact that we actually built this thing called an operational data vault. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, and then late 90s, something became really hot called operational analytics or operational data warehousing. And much of the technology just couldn't do it. But as usual, we had built something at Lockheed to handle what we now call IoT or streaming live real-time data directly into the warehouse. That said, it wasn't quite operational because it didn't have an operational application on top of it. When I got to Sendent, one of the things that the CIO said to me was, we're thinking about reconfiguring all of our operational applications. We want to reduce our entire overhead. We want to streamline our staff. We want to make the operation the systems much, much easier and better. In this way of thinking, he was really looking at operational cost. I think he said to me they had five or 10 different operational systems from Oracle Finance to this and that and the other, and they were tired of paying all these external fees. So he looked at me after we built a, a data warehouse for them to pull all this data into the data vault solution. And we had the BI coming out. He said, this is all well and good, but what if we were to build an operational application directly on top of the analytical system, the data warehouse itself? Could we do it using the data vault solution? I said, yes, and I'd done it before, so I knew it would work. And I proceeded to help work with them over the course of seven months or a year to get this put in place. And they hired a team of programmers and completely replaced or rebuilt their entire operational application and put it directly on top of the warehouse. They eliminated the need for ETL and ELT, except when they were ingesting external data. Of course, anytime you ex ingest external data, you still need to pull in, you know, use an ELT or an ETL tool to pull it, to wrangle it, and to, to put it in place. These days, you're probably better off using something like Airflow or, a, you know, a real-time solution and doing transactional message processing than you are in doing big-time system batch. But this was 2000, and I want to say 2004 that we did this or 2003. So at Send and Timeshare, we actually constructed directly on top of a data vault, the operational system. That was for all intents purposes, an operational data warehouse. And, and really what that meant was that all of the data that went into the operational screens that was pulled live into the operational screens was actually just simply reinserted. We did 100% insert driven. We never updated the data in place, thus creating the historical audit trail right there in the warehouse. The data didn't have to move. It didn't go across different operational systems. It was all synchronized by business key. We started with the ontology and the taxonomy of the business right from the start. So everything was there and, and the analytics were live in real time as well. And this made it so cohesive. Now, fast forward about six months after we got it done, I got a call from the CIO and he was on a golf course somewhere in Florida, which is where the headquarters was. And he said, oh, thank you for that operational data vault idea. We just doubled or tripled our revenues and we just sold our company. And it was because of this entire, now it wasn't just data vault itself that did this, but it was because of this entire solution and the, the whole stack and the whole notion of reducing cost and, and really building the analytic system directly into the operational system and marrying those two back together that made the difference. It was also because the data vault is really a a system of record for an operational store. So if you think of it that way and you say, well, wait a minute. So now you're telling me my data warehouse needs to be a system of record. I would say yes. In certain instances where there is no operational system, the data warehouse is the only system of record. 
And what we did was, as I said before, we would extract the data directly from the warehouse tables, display it on the screen, and yeah, we'd issue acid locking in the database. And we did this in Oracle, so it was operationally locked using acid techniques. And when the row was edited or updated or saved in the operational system, of course, it would then either commit or roll back the lock. And in the commit cycle, it never updated the record. As I said before, it inserted a new one if there was a delta. So all the delta processing was done on a transaction by transaction level. And so you knew inside the transaction, you knew exactly if the record was going to change, what values were changing. And this made aggregation to live analytics on dashboards immediate. We could tell which aggregate was supposed to be updated and by how much right from that transaction. And then we could back it up by looking at the history of the transactional changes in the data vault, which we do in other systems. We could back it up and say, okay, if we ever have to rebuild this aggregate or synchronize this aggregate or rebalance this aggregate, we could do it. It was all there. And so this was a huge leap forward. I, I really think that this is the future. We've got a, a couple of other applications to talk about. And, and Sanjay, I want to hear some of your, your thoughts on this as well. Yeah. When, when you say this is the future, you were already on the future in 2004. That's pretty impressive <laughs> because the reason I brought this up is Snowflake recently announced this product called Unistore, where the storage is kind of designed for both transactional and analytical applications. And I think anybody building anything on Unistore would benefit from it, data vault design. But we all know it's not just the model. We have to look at it from a solution perspective. And if you don't look at it from a solution perspective, there's honestly, there's no point. But if you look at it from a solution perspective, I see that leveraging new technologies like Snowflake Unistore and whatever is going to come after it, because as soon as one gets released, I'm sure there'll be more in the industry who would follow with that, with the capabilities of separating storage from processing in the cloud. I don't see how anybody else is going to be left behind on these kind of concepts. And once they have that, I think that would be a leap forward for everybody, but our data vault is already ready for it. Like you already proven it in 2004, <laughs> which is something that I found really interesting. I'm like, okay, maybe we should start talking to application developers and, and <laughs> you know, get them into the CDVP too, because the thing is they're going to end up building analytics anyway, and they may as well leverage this because you honestly can't get more real time than, you know, if it's in the application, it's in it's in the analytical solution. Yeah. There's nothing more real time than that. It's already there. There's yeah. no ETL, yeah. like you said. This fits into a lot of the new concepts as well, like, like the new concepts, data mesh and stuff that you've talked about in past podcasts. It actually fits into those concepts. There are issues because if there are, there are companies who can build it from scratch, if there are companies who with entire corporations who have multiple applications, unless they are looking at a portion of it or building brand new stuff, they have to consider it piecemeal, right? Like it, it's not something that they should do as a big bang anyway, right? Uh, never do a big bang, never boil the ocean, that doesn't work. And I think we all know that. And if we don't, we need to go back to school. <laughs> but I want to put a couple of shout outs to some folks that have built some of these systems along the way. Uh, one is Michael Olshinka at Scale Free. A couple of years ago, he built a real-time data vault with operational data coming from IoT devices uh, from an auto manufacturer perspective. And they had a real-time dashboard with all kinds of alerts and messaging going on. It was a fantastic thing. In fact, they presented this entire solution and the dashboards and what they had done using Redis Cache and all kinds of wonderful tech at the conference, at the Data Vault conference. I, I guess it was about seven years ago now. Hard to imagine that it was that long. But yeah, I want to give another shout out to Mary Mink and uh, Sam Bendayan who worked with me on a real operational data vault at Ultimate Software. And yeah, I'm going to get into that. I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to skin that a little bit more than just talking about the operational data vault, because I think that's a different beast from just the operational data vault. So I, I do want you to get into that, but I, I, before we get into the operational side of things, I, I, uh, I do want to talk about how an application now, because of cloud solutions, we have these software as a service applications. They built this cloud application, ultimate software that, and they built analytics on it using a data vault. And how many customers did they service? Some 2,500 to 2,800, I believe. If you can talk about how they did that and the whole multi-tenant concept, I think right. that would be very enlightening to the audience. Now, I got to say this, uh, neither Sam nor Mary are, are with Ultimate anymore. Uh, they're now successfully doing other things, but they're still working in the data vault landscape, which is great. As such, we don't know if Ultimate is still leveraging the data vault in the, in the concept or constructs that they were. 
but it's really cool. When they built it, yeah, they had 2,500 to 28 different hundred customers in the cloud using the SaaS application sitting directly on top of the operational data vault. And of course, everybody's scratching their heads going, well, wait a minute, how do you build a warehouse on top of an operational or an operational system on top of a a data warehouse solution? Well, the answer is simpler than you think, at least with the data vault, because the data vault construct is based again on business concept modeling. If you look at business concepts and the next thing you need is a business key and the business key is needed by operational systems to uniquely identify the records underneath. The only other thing that operational systems really need is this edit lock. So you can have multiple users on the records at the same time, looking up things and and editing through operational screens. But then the question is, technologically speaking, what really is an edit? If you look at it from a warehousing perspective, an edit is simply a change or a delta to something in a combined data set that's on screen. So you you might have a lookup list, you might have an edit to a, a company name, you might have a change to an address, whatever the case is, that essentially is a business edit. But when you look at it technologically, really it's a delta. And you look at it from a warehouse perspective, it should be an insert, not an update. And as long as it's a time-stamped insert and you're not updating data in place, you're good to go. The only other thing you really need to manage is the locking mechanism. It is this simple, folks. It really is this simple. You don't need to worry about third normal form. You don't need to worry about parent-child complexities. You don't need to worry about all those benefits that you get from Data Vault by eliminating re-engineering, by isolating the the impact of change at the operational system, uh, and, and by separating out the relationships into their own relationship structures, by leveraging all of those components components in the data vault, your operational application is free to move, to change with very, very little impact. It can move as fast as the business. And this is one of the things that the people who built the operational applications on top of the data vault started to see. They went, why did we ever use third normal form in the first place? Why did we ever use this complex model and this complex structure to house all this data when we could have used the data vault, leveraged little to no re-engineering in the operational application side of the house? The only question was, how do we lock multiple records at one time because an operational screen might show you context and multiple sets of records in one place. And really, it's done by begin transaction, the first user to get begin transaction. And you have to allow the data management database or the engine to do that work. So you still have concurrency to worry about, but why think about it at a design level when the database offers all of these things for you and it's designed to do this? So you issue a begin transaction. The first one to get it gets the lock. And then you select all of that data out for the operational screen that you need. And then when that's done, you maintain a lock on one or more of those records until until you issue a save. And then the logic chooses to either insert a new record because of a delta or roll back. And when it issues a commit or a rollback, obviously it releases a lock at the database record level. And that takes care of the ACID compliance and the multi-user concurrency issues dissolve because that's what those operational database systems are there for. And so if you get this stuff with the new Snowflake platform, which I'm sure they have to solve these problems and they're aware of it, they probably already have solved these issues. But once you get a platform that's capable of doing locking and unlocking, begin and commit transactions and ACID uh, compliance, you can set up an operational data vault and eliminate a lot of the crosstalk and the APIs and the interface specifications and just go to town, build your application and feel free to modify it with little to no impact on the data structures underneath and the processes underneath. And of course, it feeds right into the analytics going forward. So I'm really excited to see the new technology enable this type of a solution at volume and at high speeds. You've always been about, let's move the data as little as we can physically. That's been, I think, ever since I've known you, which is more than a decade now, you've, you've talked about that concept. And this is kind of the ultimate version of that. And I'm thinking, in my mind, the possibilities start becoming really, really endless. Now, think about this. Suppose you have a multi-tenant solution like Ultimate Software, where they are servicing multiple customers using the multi-tenant concept that the Data Vault has built into it. 
and the operational data vault uh, concepts that have been around since 2004, since the Sendent one, and I believe there may be others as well. If you combine these two concepts, it becomes a very, very powerful approach for anybody, any new startup, say, or any new company that wants to build out a SaaS-based solution. And with the mesh-like approach, which product ownerships as a separate data products, they do want those interfaces to be out in its own little nice, neat space anyway. It fits into all of those paradigms and the data vault really becomes the enabler for all of these things. And it's already been there for a while now. The, the only thing is application developers of these SaaS solutions realize the gold mine they're sitting on if they just understand the entire data vault solution and start building on it. That's interesting. That is the question. And I don't know that they get it yet. Hopefully this podcast will make it out beyond the walls of I understand data vault, right? To to new folks and feel free to share it. That's why we do this. But And we're happy to talk to any application programmers. I've been there in the past. I've coded application, operational application systems. I know what this piece is. There, there's no smoke. There's no magic. There, there is a layer. It's called a data access layer. And the data access layer is an interface layer. And it maintains the locking. So any operational application programmer just simply talks to the data access layer once it's built and it goes after the table structures and locks the data appropriately and returns it. It looks just like an operational application select to the application program. If you can build this layer, you can pretty much deploy this layer to anybody anywhere in the world. And then of course the analytics are also part of the data access layer and you can just flow that right through. It's, it's really a, a, a self-service operational application build process at that point. It's pretty cool. If you couple that with Snowflake's ability to already store, manipulate, and leverage JSON, for example, in high speed and high volume environments, now you've got magic going on. Again, because you don't have to worry about the update. If you remove the physical update from the data layers and you say, well, we're going to go 100% insert driven, which is part of what the data vault process and methodology is all about, you go 100% insert driven, then the update happens in the application layer, you determine if there's a delta, and then you simply insert the brand new JSON record and let the data analytics solution figure out the rest. So there's a lot of benefits to be had if you want to build an operational application on top of a data vault. We can definitely help you there. Like I said, I'm super excited, and you can probably tell we've built multiple data vault solutions with analytic streaming over the years, one of them at Raytheon, one of them at Lockheed in the beginning, different companies uh, that we've had present. And so it really is time to bring together operational systems and analytics back in the same platform and, and really run forward from here. There, there's no reason to leverage or be stuck in the old world where an operational system has to be married to a particular type of modeling component that locks it in to rework and rebuild and re-engineering efforts every time you want to make a change. If you leverage the data vault, all the benefits that we bring from an operational perspective, you really can go to town. It's, it's quite something to see. I did want to add to this in, in terms of it's not just JSON, it's even on the tabular constructs. We have a lot of benefits of using the data vault, especially with new features like Unistore. And then um, not just that, I don't know if you know about the Apache Iceberg uh, model, which allows you to change uh, the storage uh, model, you know, like uh, different storage models like Avro and the newfangled ones uh, that came after Hadoop. But now Iceberg appears to be uh, something that is designed for transactional, but is also designed for change without impact. And that fits it when our, with our data vault motto. And I think we can really leverage this. People should really benefit from this. In terms of closing thoughts, I think from a risk mitigation perspective, before people implement any of this, I think they should go to data vault training. From a business perspective, I see there, it's a no-brainer for most businesses to try out things, especially if they're a startup. It just makes sense. That's what I think. I think you brought up Raytheon. I don't know if you have time to go into that, but that might be another podcast. Yeah, I think that's another story. There's a lot to the Raytheon story that gets interesting quickly. All so right. we'll cover that next time or on another podcast. All right. This is Sanjay Pandey. And this is Dan Linstead saying thank you very much for listening. We'll see you in another podcast. <laughs>